Hey everyone, this is Tracy Friedlander. You're listening to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. On the show today, I have Sarah Bell Reed. Sarah combines trumpet and electronics to create a completely unique genre all her own. But Sarah didn't start out doing this, obviously. In college, she was firmly on the path toward a traditional trumpet orchestra career. You'll hear all about how she went from heading for an orchestra career to one she's completely invented. And now with nearly 19,000 followers on Instagram, she's clearly tapped into a niche I, for one, didn't even realize existed. So not only has she created this cool career as a performing and recording artist, she's now also teaching programs on how to use electronic instruments um, to musicians and amateur hobbyists who want to start creating some new sounds in their music. I love that she's building a well-rounded business as a teacher, coach, performer, and recording artist, and she's absolutely crushing it. I can't wait for you to hear this interview. But before we get started, a couple of quick things. As everyone is navigating the world we're in today, suddenly for a lot of musicians, teaching has become a lot more than a side gig in addition to orchestra work. As this evolution has taken place, so many people have shared with me that what used to work okay with students regarding scheduling and payments no longer works. So many people used to take cash, checks, PayPal, direct deposit, and it got so disorganized, not to mention the constant scheduling and rescheduling via email and text with students. You don't have to do that anymore. I want you to know about a website called Fons, F-O-N-S. You gotta check it out. You can transform the way you operate with your students, streamline payments all in one place. Students can schedule through the app and have recurring lessons all organized through the site. And they'll even get reminder emails. Fons can seriously uplevel your lesson studio into a business look more professional from the outside from st- for students and parents and save you tons of time. If you're interested and you want to try Fonz, just for Crushing Classical listeners, you can clink, click the link in the show notes and get a full extra 30 days free to try it out in addition to the initial two-week trial that you normally get. If you want to give that a shot, check out the link in the show notes, Fonz.com slash join slash at Tracy G. Friedlander. You'll find that in the show notes. Let's get started. Welcome to Crushing Classical, Sarah. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So I discovered you kind of through another podcast. Actually, someone who's doing my program has a podcast, Thomas Fortner. And he told me about you. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I need to have a conversation with you. So, um, so you're, you're a trumpet player and you do all this really cool, creative electronic stuff. And I'm going to, I would love for you to describe what it is to the audience. Cause I don't want to try and then be like <laughs> completely <laughs> not doing it justice. Sure. Um, let's see how I can boil it down into just a short introduction. I guess what I like to say is that my main interest in music is combining my trumpet playing uh, with a lot of different types of electronic stuff. So electronic instruments, um, my laptop computer, I consider to be one of my main instruments as well. Um, And a lot of things over the years that I've just built myself. So a lot of gadgets and sound making devices and things like that, that I've designed and built. So um, yeah, that's kind of my main passion is just integrating and combining this very acoustic organic world through the trumpet, which is my origins in music with all of the new possibilities and sounds and ways of interacting with sound that come from electronics. That's so cool. And I'm glad you mentioned like the acoustic world because you talked about, we talked about this before. I'd love for you to tell a little bit more about like your kind of beginnings. Like you, you were really on the the path to a regular kind of orchestral trumpet career, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. My, I started as a very young kid playing piano, classical piano, and then I picked up the trumpet. I went to call, um, university to do an undergrad degree in classical trumpet performance. And that was absolutely my, what I thought was my everything at that point. And it really was actually, because it was not only what I wanted to do, but it was all I knew I could do at that point yeah. in my life. Um, so yeah, I've definitely, some things have changed over the years, but I still really appreciate and am so grateful for my roots in the classical training. Um, because I think that they're so, they're, they've played such a huge role in allowing me to kind of develop my musical voice the way that it has over the years. Interesting. Um, and I never, I never want to get rid of that. So, you know, a lot of people will ask me things like, why don't you just play electronic instruments and go full into that? And it, that never feels satisfying to me because really the, the breath and the acoustic sound and the, the acoustic instrument interaction that comes with being a brass player is critical to me. It feels like just a part of my body, you know, I'm sure you understand as a fellow yeah. <laughs> brass player. Yeah. As yeah. a horn player. I mean, I've actually said that. I don't think I've ever really been able to explain it like you, but, um, but I feel like there's been times where I've been like, I just like how this feels. Yeah. Like it, it feels like exercise in a way like that, you know, how that feeling you get when you're like, okay, you know, I just exercised. I did something for my muscles. There's like something going on there that that's like part of you after a while. So, so how did you sort of, how did you get started experimenting with electronics? I stumbled into things very slowly and very accidentally. I think I didn't really know it was happening as it was happening. It was one of those strange circumstances. I can elaborate a little bit more on that because that doesn't make very much sense. <laughs> um, but I think, so I, re I vaguely remember at my, my undergrad school, which was McGill, the, the university I did my undergrad at, um, at the very end of my degree, I saw someone doing a performance with this strange object that I afterwards learned was called a tea stick. And it was basically this like interactive gestural controller. There was a cellist on stage playing cello and they were like moving this thing around and it was somehow manipulating the sound. And I didn't understand what was happening at all, but that was my first moment when I saw this com combination of acoustic performance and electronics. And I was super curious. And then it wasn't until years quite, I think at least two years later that I was out doing my graduate degree in California. Um, and a teacher randomly said to me, you should take my class, it's about programming electronics blah 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 and I didn't know at you know anything about anything so I was like sure why not I'll do that I'm here yeah <laughs> I'll sign up it was the hardest class I've ever taken in my life and I barely got through it but it was the thing that allowed me to start kind of tinkering and experimenting what was so hard about the class it was just like a new language for me I had never done any electric electrical engineering any computer science any music technology. I mean, I hadn't even ever used a recording, like a DAW to record my sound at all. You know, I was doing audition tapes and stuff using uh, a little like one button press kind of recorder. It yeah. was all just there. You know, I didn't, I wasn't using technology. I wasn't familiar with it. So this was just like going straight into the deep end to this world where everything was new to me. And I think mm -hmm. that's what made it so difficult was I, you know, it's a whole new language. <laughs> right. You know, it was very overwhelming, but it was, it, it led to some pretty cool, like I stayed with it long enough that um, I finally started to be able to make sound with it. And then I was like, okay, I get this. It can be music. I just, I just need to rearrange the letters in this order <laughs> or the words in this order. And now it's starting to make sense. So. That's so cool. So how did you like, how did you get from the place of I'm learning in a totally new language and taking a class just for the heck of it because someone asked me to, to like, I'm going to start really diving into experimenting how this works with my trumpet. And like, I mean, let me just say like, it's a huge leap to go from 
I play orchestral excerpts and I'm trying to get an orchestra job to I'm creating completely something new. Not only, not only what, like something completely new, but something with the instrument that I was originally trying to do something really traditional with. So like, how did you, what, what caused you to sort of start going in that direction? Yeah, that I, you know, I think that that was also a lot of small, important, important, but tiny events, you know, just meeting certain mm -hmm. people who would nudge me in one direction or another, even if they weren't meaning to just by like the things that they would talk about. Um, at that point in my life, I was in a very sponge like state, <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. I had just finished my undergrad and I was feeling really kind of, um, I mean, I guess just the, the simple word is discouraged. Like I was really having a hard go at things. I was really starting to reconsider if this was what I wanted to do. I was struggling with a lot of my ability to play the way that I wanted to play and ability to perform. And, um, and so I think that that opened me up to basically being willing to receive anything, you know, to be like, okay, world, I don't know what, what I'm doing here. I don't know why I'm doing it, but I've just signed up for another degree, which has felt crazy at the time. Like I'm, I've just committed to two more years. So mm -hmm. whatever you want to throw at me, um, I'll at least give it a chance kind of thing. Um, and so I found myself at a great school called CalArts, which is very, it's a very experimental place. At the time, I didn't know that really, but it was the best thing that I could have done for myself because I was constantly being thrown, you know, here's a totally new perspective that you've never considered. Right. Um, like, hey, improvisation, let's do that. Or- So why did you end up going there? Like if you were on that went, traditional path? Like yeah, good question. Yeah, I went there because of my teacher. I had the same teacher from my undergrad to my- he taught at both schools. Okay. And you were like, I need to stick with you. Like you're yeah, just, yeah, exactly. He felt <laughs> it just was one familiar thing, one kind of thread that I understood. And I was like, I'm just going to keep going. And you yeah. know, California seems nice. I hear it's sunny. So I'll try that out <laughs> and see what happens. But I really had intentions to continue being a classical trumpet player. Maybe with a little bit more contemporary music thrown into the mix, but I wasn't expecting to fully change directions. Um, yeah, so, you know, I just, I met a bunch of different people. It was, it was hard to not be inspired by them because they were so passionate about what they were doing. And that was really contagious at that point in my life. I was like, wow, these people are doing music and they're loving music as opposed to me, who's over here, like just feeling so nervous about everything. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was in this technology class that I mentioned, one of the main projects for the semester was to dream up and design your own instrument. Um, and after a lot of research, I, I, I decided to create this trumpet instrument that could combine these two worlds together because I was still very much, as I said, really rooted in the classical trumpet stuff. Um, and that's kind of where it all began. Once I got invested in that project, I had, it wasn't just a class assignment anymore. It was like, okay, wait a second. I can actually build myself an instrument that does everything I want it to do, takes this already incredible thing, which is the trumpet, and makes it even cooler based on the things that I'm currently super excited about. Like, that sounds like a dream. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, you know, and then, and then it started like over, and I'm, I mean, I'm condensing this story down into a few minutes, but it's important. I always think it's really important for people to know that it was months and months and months and years, you know, it was not an overnight thing where I'm like, I'm going to build a trumpet. Done. <laughs> not <laughs> right. at all. Right. Um, it's so easy to hear a story and go, wow, everything's so easy and perfect picture. Perfect. Yeah. Tell us yeah. some of the, tell us some of the struggle stories. Cause like, you know, as long as we're talking about that, like, were there times where you're like, what am I doing? Or were there times where you're like, wait a second, my identity is rooted in playing excerpts. Like I need, like, I'm not a real musician if I'm not a, taking auditions or what, what about the other people in your life? Cause I know that a lot of times when you're making an artistic change or a career, like anything altering, not the same as what your colleagues are, are used to seeing you do that 
there's like this experience of other people seeing you a certain way and then they just don't get it if you're trying to share something that's really like new and cool for you there's no support sometimes i mean i know you had good support at that school but like what was it like being in this kind of one foot in one world and one foot in another yeah yeah it w- i definitely went through a pretty significant identity crisis <laughs> experience um in many respects it lasted a long time to be honest but it was it was interesting because i um as i was ex- kind of experimenting with this new voice and this new way of playing trumpet I definitely felt like I was losing, and this might be something I put on myself. You know, I think often we are our own toughest observers, right? And critics. And so I felt like everyone around me was thinking, oh, she's no, she's not serious anymore. She's not legit. She just plays around with these gadgets and makes lights blink and, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 whatever. Um, she's not a real trumpet player. Because in my mind, a real trumpet player. <laughs> It sounds so silly now, but was someone who only did trumpet all day, every day, the wake up, practice before breakfast, think about excerpts when you drink coffee. I don't even know, but (laughs) all day, every day, that's it. Because I was really brought up to think in my early training that that was the way to mask, to be like a master in the field. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had a lot of resistance to the fact that I was actually enjoying these other things. And I tried to stop myself a bunch. I kind of got my own way where I would make a little bit of progress. And I, I would spend five, six hours in the lab instead of with the horn on my face, I would be programming something and, and it would be working. And on the one hand, I'd feel so exhilarated and excited because I just made this huge step forward. Um, But it would always be wrapped up in this kind of fear and guilt about this other part of my life that I felt like I was somehow leaving behind. Mm. Um, So yeah, that was really challenging. And I think eventually it got to a point where I, um, let's see, I remember having a conversation with someone about it at one of my mentors at the school at the time, who's a multi-instrumentalist. And I went to him to talk to him to be like, how do you, how do you balance? Cause he plays, literally about 12 different instruments and he plays them all really, really well. And I was thinking, you must practice 49 hours a day. Like, how do you make that happen? You know? And he just says that he does it. You just, he's like, you just do it. And if you do it long enough, then it will become the thing you do. And it kind of blew my mind. I mean, that sounds so simple, but you just do it and you do it long enough. And then it becomes the thing that you do. And what he told me is that when people call him now for, for work, they don't call him to play bass clarinet or flute or saxophone or whatever it is. They just call him. They say, hey, we want you to come play on our record. Do whatever you're going to do. We know that when we call you, you're like one, you, we get one of 12 different options or something. And that was the moment, one of the moments where I was like, okay, that's what I want. That's how I want to be working and living as a musician. I want to be a musician first. And a, and a trumpet player is part of that, as opposed to the flip from years before was my trumpet identity was everything. It was my whole identity, you know? Um, so I hope that makes sense. So basically it was this, it was kind of this pivot where I was like, my goal is to be a musician. And sometimes as a musician, I play computer. Sometimes I play random noise making objects that I, you know, Sometimes I play trumpet and I want to be able to do all of those with the same amount of commitment and sincerity and care because I don't think that they one over the other makes me more or less of a musician, even though the trumpet is the like formal instrument, you know? Yeah. Um, That's so, that's so inspiring because, you know, the, the idea that someone could be hired because they're who they are, versus the instrument they play is like blowing my mind, you know, because, you know, you know that you're technically in competition with every person who plays your instrument. Like I remember when I first moved to Chicago and then thinking about breaking into the freelance scene, I was like, well, why would anyone call me? There's like 50 or 60 other horn players here and they've been doing it longer. 
you know, like the only chance I have is that, is that everyone's busy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's no reason why they would pick, you know, one person over the other, maybe like intricacies, like, oh, the last time I played with you, you did a really good job. So I'm going to call you again. But like what you just described with this other multi-instrumentalist person is that like, that's going to be a situation where someone goes, whatever his name is, I don't know what it is, Joe, let's say it's Joe. I need, I need Joe here. Yeah. Like he's the guy we need. I need Sarah here because we're looking for this like unique thing, you know? And then you, you're sort of free. You're free to be creative. You're free to create a totally different kind of career. So yeah. that's cool that you had like that month, a few like mind blowing kind of conversations and experiences there that led you along yeah. this path of thinking about things differently. Yeah, I think it does add one more thing. I think as a younger student, I was really in a mindset where I was waiting for permission to do things. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for my teacher to say, now you can play this piece of music or now yeah. you can blah, blah, whatever it is. Um, and I think a really big thing for me was that came in, in the same time as hearing this comment about you, you can do whatever you want to do. You just have to do it and then it will become the thing you do. Yeah. Is... Um, you don't need permit. You're the only person who can give yourself and should be giving yourself permission to do the things you want to do. Right. So I think I see a lot of people who are, and I find myself still get stuck in this sometimes where it's like, I really wish I could do that, but gosh, if you know, I'm waiting for this or I feel stuck on that or what will people think? It's like, I'm actually the only person who can kind of give myself that permission and can take that first step. So if I'm feeling frustrated, it's all on me <laughs> to, to kind of change. Um, that was a big moment for me as well. Cause I just didn't even realize you could have a career as a experimental, whatever, electroacoustic trumpet player who mostly improvises. I didn't know that that was a valid possibility. Um, and I was waiting for someone to pick up the phone and say, hello, Sarah, would you like <laughs> to be the second chair in the, experimental electronic like it didn't make any sense it wasn't going to happen right. so I basically had to realize that and decide like oh, all I have to do is just to start doing it you know yes, I give myself yes. permission to make that kind of music even though I'm not seeing other people immediately in my little trumpet bubble making that kind of music Totally. So you yeah. said two things that I totally want to dive into more. Okay. One is your career, which we'll talk about in a second, but the other one is improvising. So like, obviously on the traditional path, you don't learn improvising. <laughs> like the most improvising I ever did before was like my warm up. Like I can make up an arpeggio style, <laughs> you know, like what do you, how do you start <laughs> learning and exploring that as well? And, and, you know, especially getting the skills because there's skills involved in being able to know what to do next when you're, when you're playing completely improvisationally. So. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of different answers to that question. And I really, I mean, for me, it was really about not, truthfully, it was really about not knowing what I was doing and kind of just doing it anyways and then being like okay that could have been different or better worse or oh hey that was actually not so bad that was kind of fun that was really how I because I was thrown in I ended up in a in a couple situations a couple different different ensembles where improvisation was something that I had to do and I didn't know that until I was sitting in the chair in the ensemble like <laughs> with the band leader in front of me pointing at me and I remember so well how nervous I got. Like, I, even as I talk about it, I can feel my hands kind of clam up just thinking about it. So I just want to say that if there are people out there who feel similarly, I absolutely am with you, or at least I was. But um, a couple big things that helped me, I started around that time, I started to read a lot of Pauline Oliveros's writing. I don't know if folks are familiar with her, but I can do a really quick introduction. She's, she was no longer alive, but she's a pioneer of electroacoustic music and did a lot of early tape music. Um, and in the, later on in her life and her career, she created this practice that she called deep listening. 
um, which is, she describes it kind of as a way of life. It's just this idea of listening to all of the sounds that not only the sounds that you make from your instrument, like your musical sounds, but incidental sounds, sounds that maybe, you know, are not, are extra musical, like the clicking of the valves on your horn or your wind for your horn or um, even just things like the alarm going off in the room next door or a person laughing and all of these different sounds and to really adopt this kind of way of listening to them where they can all become important and valued part a part of your musical practice so you you literally practice listening as part of your kind of creative development um, and it's a form of meditation almost where you're saying okay I'm going to listen to all of these sounds with awareness and intention and I'm just going to sit with them for a while and something about doing this and there's books she's written books for anyone who's interested if you google her you'll probably come up with a few different things um but regardless, the, the approach and the spirit to this deep listening thing was so non-judgmental and so welcoming. And I found it right at the right time when I was approaching improvisation and like approaching all these new musical worlds. To me, it felt like the perfect pairing. And I was able to adopt this kind of idea where it was like, okay, if I listen in that way to myself when I'm imp attempting to improvise, and if I'm truly doing it, like, listening with curiosity and wonder and interest, then I can't really go wrong. You know, even if I play a note that maybe sounds a little bit out of, out of place or a sound, if I like play a, something that's not centered or just doesn't sound pretty, if I'm really trying to adopt this like mindful listening, then it'll, I'll still learn from it. It'll still be kind of cool. So I don't know that that was something that was really helpful for me. And I should also say that the kind of improvising I was doing was not super intricate, you know, jazz improvisation that was over specific changes that had to be really, that's a kind of a different world where you really do need to know the vocabulary and the changes. I was doing much more um, kind of open-ended amorphous, anything goes kind of improvisation. Mm -hmm. So I really could bring this kind of exploratory spirit into it. Um, and it helped me a lot. It also helped me a lot with my stage, stage fright and just overall confidence. So could be a thing to, for folks to check out if they're interested. Um, That's interesting. Was, did you have a lot of stage fright? I did. <laughs> oh my God. I sure oh. did. I had awful stage fright. Awful, awful, awful. Like wheels coming off, walking off stage mid-performance, adrenaline flying out of my ears, like those cartoon characters where the steam's <laughs> coming out of their ears. That's how I felt. It was, it was really bad. But you know, um, that was when I was younger, I was an undergrad and I was doing mostly classical music. And all of that started to shift when I started to shift my the kind of music I was making and the reasons why I was making it. Mm. Um, you know, part of this idea that I got out of this whole deep listening thing is that music making is more of a shared experience than a one directional, I am musician, you are audience, I am presenting to you kind of experience, which is how I was very much thinking about it before. Like and they're you, out there waiting for something perfect and exactly. you have to put the pressure on to make it that way. Exactly. And if you deliver anything less then you failed them and they'll yeah. be rightfully disappointed. Yeah, yeah. But when you think of it more like a shared experience, especially if you're improvising, then you can adopt this mindset of, Hey, we're all here together. Let's see what happens. I'm exploring. I happen to be the person exploring with the sound making device, but you're all here. We're all hearing these sounds for the first time together. You know, it takes a lot of the pressure off. Yeah. Um, at least it did for me. It really helped me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. In our other conversation, you shared a story about like, that you thought maybe you'd fixed your sage fright. How did like you connected, you realized that it was really the music style of what you're doing now that was the key factor, right? I think for me it was, yeah. I think even though I love that, I love orchestral music so much, um, I just think it was a mismatch for me 
as a performer. And, and that was also, speaking of the whole identity crisis thing that we talked about earlier, that was really hard for me to, to stomach because I felt like an epic failure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, I'm not good. Like, it, you know, I'm not good enough at this. I just can't, I can't do it. Or even what was more difficult to swallow was realizing that maybe my heart wasn't totally in it. Mm. Um, and that might be why I was so like having such a hard time getting through auditions and stuff. Cause I, because when I ended up starting to play my own music, I was improvising more or I was, you know, playing around with sounds that I was also simultaneously designing, which was kind of my first step into the world of composition, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the nerves went away because the whole reason of making music wasn't to execute something flawlessly in order to kind of fit someone else's musical idea. It was more about exploration. It was more about, let's see what this does. Let's listen to this cool sound. Let's follow this musical idea for a while. And it really, to me, that was a big, big, big shift. Um, yeah, I experimented with it a little bit a couple years into kind of my new music <laughs> practice, whatever you want to call that. I took a gig that was a more traditional gig just to see. It was offered to me and I was like, sure, why not? Let's do this. And it was, it confirmed it hands down 100%. I was like a nervous wreck. I was like a different person. Wow. I was worried about missing all my entrances. I was so much in my head. I was just all of this old kind of baggage was coming back and I wasn't playing nearly as well, you know? And then the next day I had something where I got to play in the way that felt truer to myself. And it was like night and day. Wow. So it was pretty interesting. Yeah. It was a big, a big being willing to, a big case of being willing to like let go of something that I really cared a lot about in order to open up a huge world of possibilities that, um, you know, that I didn't know existed. <laughs> yeah, would you say, that makes would, sense. yeah, it does make sense. Would you say that that was like the moment or was there a, like a real moment where you're like, you know what, this is where I'm at now. I'm, I'm really like, this is, this is who I am now and all that stuff didn't bother you anymore or did it gradually fade away? I think it was a little more gradual. Mm. Um, I think, although I will say the first time I ever performed my own, my, my graduate, um, concert or recital from my grad degree, I decided to co-compose all of the music with two of my really, really good friends. And we wrote one long concert length piece as opposed to doing the recital, like broken up, you know, piece, piece, piece kind of structure. Um, and that was the first time that I'd ever kind of composed any music. And I, I like gave myself the support by not having to do it all on my own because I had two other co-composers. So whenever I would get overwhelmed or stuck, I'd be like, what do you think we should do? <laughs> Help me. And it turned out to be a really cool thing. But that, I think that that was probably a pretty significant event for me because it was my first moment saying like, hey, I'm not just playing trumpet literature. You know, I've put on an entire trumpet graduation concert, but it's all stuff that didn't exist three months ago or whatever. So it was like a 45 minute piece? Yeah, it was a little shorter actually. I think maybe 30 minutes or something. So maybe not a full concert length, but it was enough for me. (laughs) It was a lot. That's amazing. That's so cool. So then, so as you've been developing your career, I mean, now you have a career that's completely unique to you, which is so amazing. I love, I love that so much. And that's like, so indicative of the people I have on, most of the people that are on this podcast are like people who, you know, you have this career and actually literally nobody else has that career. It's so cool. But I know that doesn't happen overnight. Um, So like, how do you, how has things, have things evolved for you Like you have a ton of Instagram followers, you know, (laughs) you're like 16, more than 16,000 followers, which is awesome. How did that happen? Like, how did, how did all of these things start to fall into place so that people were paying you money Mm -hmm. to, um, to do that? 
Very slowly. <laughs> That's the, the first thing I want to say. Again, I think it's really easy to look at, and I do this still too. You look at something and, or someone, you're like, wow, they, they've got it all figured out. You know, they must have just, yeah. they've got the answers. Yeah, really, really slowly. For me, um, what I started doing is I decided one day, I was working in an office job. Uh, this was after my graduate degree that we've been talking about. So I finished that, I got a day job. Um, and I was really not, not, I was, it was okay, it was cool, but I really wanted to be making music, you know, yeah. like that wasn't my passion. And I remember one day for some reason, I just, I saw something about Instagram or I heard a podcast. I would listen to podcasts often while I was working and things like that. And I thought, you know, what? I'm just gonna post some stuff on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Without knowing what I was doing. And specifically what I was inspired to do in that moment was to post stuff about that was related to what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, this comes back to the whole idea of like, you've got to do what you want to do and then it will be the thing that you're doing. Yeah. So I was still getting occasional calls for work that I would take because I felt obligated to do it because it was all I was getting asked to do. Right. And, but it was not really aligned with my passion. It, you know, it didn't feel great. So I thought, okay, I'm just gonna start putting stuff on Instagram that has something to do with what I wanna do. So trumpet and electronics or improvised music or more extended techniques, more experimental sounds, things like that. And I started to do that um, every day or a couple times a week without any real method or strategy. And then slowly, well, you know, actually over like maybe a couple months into it, I would start to get messages from people who are like, hey, this is cool. Do you wanna come play at my house concert that doesn't pay anything and we'll probably have four people in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, yes, I was, sure. Can I do what I wanna do? Can I do anything? And they'd say, yeah, you can do anything. And that was the beginning of the whole switch over to being kind of called to be a musician first or like being asked to do work as myself and not as a trumpet player to play this music, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's funny, even today when I get asked to do things, I still am like, can I do anything? <laughs> Just to clarify, <laughs> can I play anything? Um, it still makes me so happy uh, that that is a thing that happens. Um, so yeah, that started to pick up. And then, you know, naturally over the course of half a year, a number of months, you start to meet other folks who are more in your, in that new world that you're stepping into. And it really does kind of expand from there because they'll say, oh, do you want to play like a duo sometime? And you're like, sure, let's do that. And then there's another random house concert that doesn't pay that has 10 people in the audience. <laughs> and it started to build from there. Do they give um, you food? They, pay, they paid you in food. <laughs> yeah, or they'll pay you gas money or something. I did a lot of those. Like they'll give you, LA, in LA, it's gas money is often a, a strong incentive. <laughs> so much driving. But, you know, eventually they do start, like you get a slightly more funded gigs. And, and I'm definitely not advocating for people to take, to do work for free. It was a tricky gray zone for me. Um, I was so excited to be finally just doing what I wanted to do, right. that the experience of doing that seemed worthwhile to me. Um, but, but yeah, it, it started to grow pretty, you know, over time and people would say, hey, now I've got this actual, <laughs> this actual gig that you can do that yeah. will actually- And you're, you you're being visible around yeah. the thing that you wanna be doing, whether that's visible in front of real people at a house concert or just on Instagram. And you know what, I will say, um, I scrolled to the bottom, like, because it's so easy. It's so easy for people to go, oh my God, 16,000 followers. I can never get that. Like, that's amazing, you know, and you just feel kind of defeated, but that's like mm -hmm. seeing the finished, that's seeing some, you started in 2012. Like that was right. a long time ago. And your first yeah. posts were like, this is my dog. Yeah, 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 my dog. <laughs> this is my cup of coffee. Like, you know, you just start until it's the thing that you're doing. And I love exactly. that phrase so much because over time you started to see, okay, this is what I'm posting. This is what I'm, this is what I 
post that's about what I do. This is what's getting traction. So I'm going to do more of that. And before you knew it, it's a part of what you do. So it's not a burden to post on Instagram because you're just like, this is what I do. And there's people who want to see it. So it yeah. probably becomes just part of your everyday activities, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit, you just hit on a lot of really good thoughts. I mean, one is that you just start like the biggest mistake or not mistake, but the biggest disservice you can do for yourself is to not do anything mm -hmm. because yeah, you'll probably make quote unquote mistake. You'll post something wrong. Who, I mean, I think they're all pretty small mistakes in the grand scheme yeah. of things, but the biggest actual mistake is to not take any action at all. Yeah. And just to sit and kind of wait. And um, because any action, even if it's like, Ooh, that post didn't do anything. That yeah, is a good, really valuable learning experience. Totally. And people won't remember it. Of course they won't. I know people. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot. I used to worry that I would be bugging people like, oh, they don't want to see another thing from me. And, and someone said to me, which is just so profound and so correct. It's like, if they don't want to look at your stuff, they won't look at your stuff. It's okay. Right. You know, yeah. you're not going to upset. There's nobody sitting at their, in their home right now going, oh. Come on, Sarah, another trumpet video, give it a break. And if they are, then they can just turn it off. It's okay. Exactly. The only okay. way that's going to happen, I tell people this all the time too, because that's one of the big things is worrying about bugging people. I'm like, the only way they're going to see that is if they follow you and, and nobody else. Right. Like the <laughs> algorithm is going to make sure that your one person isn't going to see every single one of your posts. Yeah. So, you know, I think someone said that they, they said someone, one of my followers was telling me that it was too much, but it was my mom. <laughs> like, That's probably because she only follows you and nobody else. <laughs> That's really sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, we make up a lot of, a lot of obstacles for ourselves yeah. based on things that are probably hundred percent logical or they seem logical, but it's really, at, at least what I've discovered is that they're really good covert strategies for making you not do the thing <laughs> that yes. is going to push you out of your comfort zone. And we want to be like, we're creatures of kind of habit and safety. And so change is something that we're naturally going to want to resist, but, and, um, but yeah, it's like, as soon as you start to do it, uh, for me, I, I it felt so liberating because I was like, Hey, I can, I can, I don't have to wait for someone to call me and ask me to do a little concert on Instagram. I can just do it. And right. it doesn't have to be an hour long. It can be 30 seconds and that counts. And that's great. Yes. Um, so it gave me a lot of agency to kind of curate and put out my experiments as I was developing them, as opposed to incubating them in the practice room for a year or two years or five years, and then putting out this one thing, um, yeah, it just changed everything. It changed my workflow and it made me feel a lot more like the creating, the creative process was just like tangible and immediate because I would make something and then a couple hours later, I'd be like, hey, here's the thing. I made it. I exactly. Made it <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and yeah. think about this, like people, people's um, attention span has shrunk drastically. And a lot of it has to do with just our fast paced world and social media. And there's, you know, 30, a 30 second piece is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I can listen to that. It doesn't take that long. I didn't have to leave my house. It showed up in my feed. I didn't have to do anything to, to get it. You know, like, it's just so interesting to think about, yeah, that was a liberating thing for you. And it actually really is a match for the marketplace. Right. And I think that's something that, um, you know, I don't think classical music will ever completely go away because people love that genre. Like they just love it. Right. But on the other hand, there's this marketplace where the, the vast majority of popular music is drastically shorter than a Mahler symphony, right. you know? And so if you look at who's buying what, uh -huh. then, and you're a creative and you're making something, you can say, Hey, guess what? I can make something and it's super short. And it can be used for a variety of things too. Like, have you been hired to do anything really unusual, like for a video or for a movie or for like games or anything? Yeah, like that? totally. Yeah, that was another thing that started to happen. So when I, and honestly, 
um, Instagram was my only outlet. So just to really kind of paint that picture, I wasn't Mm -hmm. emailing people about stuff I was doing. I was just putting it on Instagram. Something else that started to happen was people, people would say, yeah, can you come play this or do this live at this show? But I also would get, you know, requests to put, um, what, what am I trying to say to like add something to someone's album. So they'll say, Hey, Mm -hmm. I'm working on an album. Can I send you all of the tracks and can you layer a couple trumpet and electronic tracks onto it? whatever you want. Or they'll say like maybe kind of jazz influenced or maybe really whatever. They would give me some kind of direction and then I would do that. That was really fun because I'd never been able to do that kind of thing before. Mm -hmm. Um, And other things were sound design, purely sound design jobs. So like I have this, uh, yeah, um, like I'm putting out a dance film, for example, and I need a soundtrack and I found your music and I like the vibe. Can you make, uh, can you score this five minute dance film? Cool. Um, or there are also companies that will put out packs of samples uh, and sound and loops that people can use in their own compositions. Um, so you can, you know, if you need like a intense beat or a, or like a cinematic string sound or something like that to go into one of your pieces, instead of having to go hire people and make it, you can like load one of these loops into your session. It's a good way to certainly kind of like mock up ideas and explore things. And they need composers to make all of those loops. So I started doing some of that work as well without knowing what it was, <laughs> without knowing how it worked. I definitely learned as I went. Um, so yeah, lots of different corners of the music world got opened up to me. Um, that I think I never would have discovered otherwise if I had just been sticking to the live performance. Right. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like kind of over time the income streams just sort of started layering on top of each other, like recording opportunities, shows. Very little by little, you know, but they add up for sure, especially when you have, you know, five or 10 different sources um Mm -hmm. some months one of them might be slower than others but they do they do start to kind of layer and it becomes a viable thing as long as you're okay with switching contexts which was a a definitely a challenging thing for me to start figuring out but (laughs) oh really like how so yeah well what I started having to do was dedicate you know one day say this day of the week is my day that I dedicate to this kind of work Um, like I do all my recording projects on this day and that way the next day I can work on on more composing or uh, live performance type things I just I I had to start to kind of chunk my time that way because what I was finding is that you know on any given day it was like 9 a.m live performance mindset and then all of a sudden I have to switch over to a sound design mindset and now I'm scoring something and now I'm trying to talk to someone and be a teacher and now I'm back to live performance and it was really draining Mm -hmm. so I I kind of divided my week up into larger buckets um to accommodate all of those changes in context but that's something that it was a it was a great problem to have and so I was really happy to to be like to find a solution for it and I think everyone will find something that works for them in that regard yeah no I I feel the same Um, kind of way about what I do too because when you're a musician you have like a musician in the traditional sense where it's like the orchestra has these rehearsals and the the concerts are on these nights like if you're just gigging with one orchestra right Um, then you're just used to having it set up like that so when all the work is being generated by your activities now you're like well what works for me actually do I want to be working on the weekend actually like yeah. you know what I mean like in the symphony world you don't have a choice you but choice. you do have a choice when you're a business owner yeah yeah, so, yeah. Absolutely. yeah so I know that you just created a program like a, a teaching program yeah can you tell us about that sounds I so can cool. yeah this is new I just started working on it I guess six or seven months ago um it is called learning sound and synthesis And it's a program that basically teaches 
you how to get started working with specifically modular synthesizers, which are a kind of electronic instrument that I use a lot in my own practice and I really, really love. Um, but they have a pretty high barrier to entry. They're the kind of instrument that if you, you know, oftentimes people will look at them and they look really cool. They kind of look like this cool command station in a spaceship, like a retro futuristic spaceship. <laughs> but there's all these, by design, they are made up of, they're one instrument that's made up of like sometimes dozens of little sub parts and you have to manually connect them all together and it can get really overwhelming and really daunting. Um, and so this program is, is based on that, is helping you kind of take your first steps into synthesis in general, learn how to design your own sounds from like nothing. Uh, and then from that, your own music. Um, and then to work with these instruments. And we, I teach everything, something that was really important to me was giving people a chance to kind of explore this world without having to invest in thousands of dollars of gear. Cause these instruments are thousands of dollars, just like a good trumpet. They're quite mm. expensive. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So there's this really great online program that anyone can check out. If anyone's curious, it's called VCV rack. Um, and it's free and it, it's basically a software emulator for a modular synthesizer. So you can download it and it runs on your computer and you can try out the workflow and the sound generation and the de sound design and everything completely for free. Um, which I thought was really cool. So when I discovered that that program existed, that kind of sparked the idea for this, um, for this course, because then I thought, well, now I can actually reach people who don't already have one of these instruments and they can still get their feet wet and they can learn how it all works and they can start making music. Um, with nothing more than their computer. So that was the, so cool. that was the spark. Yeah. Yeah. And in particular, I get a lot, I get a lot of questions these days about from people who are kind of like where I was many years ago, they have, they play an acoustic instrument. They're curious about kind of broadening and expanding their, their career or just their creative practice, whatever it might be. And they're curious about electronics. And so I've built that program with that kind of person in mind. Um, so it basically walks you through, you know, what is a synthesizer? It's like bare, but like very beginning. What does any of this mean? What is a waveform? What are these words that we hear? All the way through to what I, basically what I do. Like I unpack kind of the videos that you see me doing on Instagram and show you how to and other places and show you how to connect your instrument, how to process the sound and make it sound all spacey and cool and <laughs> robot-like. So cool. um, yeah, so it's, so it's been you, a lot of fun. Did you have, did you know that you had a lot of people in your world through Instagram that were like, I wanna learn this? Like when you, when you decided to make the class? I put feelers out first, mm -hmm. but I also did, yeah, I was getting a bunch of messages from people mm -hmm. and that started happening years ago and I was just like oh yeah I'll help you I was helping people one at a time in through my dms it was very time consuming yeah um, and then I think with the you know with the like everything changing this year in the way that it did and all of a sudden having all this time because my life all my tours and concerts got canceled yeah. I found myself with time and I thought well you know what this is something I've really been kind of wanting to do for a while. Maybe this is the time to do it. You know, maybe I can, I can figure it out. So I took the, the top questions basically, um, which were basically all the same question. It was, how do I get started? I'm totally overwhelmed. What do I do first? Like, you know, how does this work? And how do I connect my acoustic instrument to electronics basically? That's and so I cool. Turn that, turn that into a course. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's so cool. So it's just it's just going to get started. A new a new cohort is going to get started at the beginning of the year. If someone wants to know more, like, is there an email list or something they can join? Yeah. Or, yeah okay. Totally. Yeah. There's um, sound uh, soundandsynthesis.com is the main website, and there's a like a wait list that people can jump onto. Cool. Um, and the, you know, I, the course is not a fully DIY class. I do a combination of 
um, synchronous and asynchronous things. So there's also group coaching calls, which are really fun. We did a first welcome call for the new cohort the other day. And there were people from the US and Canada, Europe, Chile, uh, tai Taipei, Australia, the Netherlands. It was incredible. There's people from all over the world. So it's wow. an interesting opportunity also to kind of just come together as a global group of people um, who are all curious about this corner of music making. Um, but as a result, the reason why I brought that up is because I only, because it is a, a synchronous as well, I only run it two times a year. Mm, so okay. it's good. If you're curious about it, you can jo join the wait list. And then when it opens back up, you'll, you'll be notified. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. It'll probably well, be in those, six months or so. That information will definitely be in the show notes. Cause I think in this time when things are really strange and, you know, even before that though, I think a lot of people have been thinking like, how can I be more creative? How can mm -hmm. I, you know, how can I explore something and what I love about this is it gives people an opportunity to do something unique on their own and make, you know, make art with their instrument that they currently play, but just enhancing it. I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah so cool. absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So are you doing any, <laughs> like, do you have any other projects coming up that are recording based or online concert type things? I do <laughs> that's the moment when your brain kind of I think this happens to anyone else when you get asked like so what are you up to and then your brain just goes blank it's like you're like I'm yeah. up to so much I don't know what I'm up to um the biggest thing at the moment that I'm really excited about is I'm, I am working on a new album awesome and it's a slow process but I'm giving myself I'm I'm a, I'm happy this time to take my time you know I'm gonna just let it be slow. <laughs> cool. um, yeah, it's all, it's all music that I'm writing for trumpet and modular synthesizer, the instrument I was just talking about, mm -hmm. and also voice, which is something that's really new to me that I have never, I've, it's, this is another example of a thing that I've always kind of been passionate about and I've always been too nervous to do. Cause it's like, well, I'm not trained as a vocalist. I don't really have that skill set. Says who, I'm right there I with you. Yeah. I, I love, I mean, yeah, I grew up listening to all the music that was being sung. It was like popular yeah. music and I've always wanted to explore that, but I had the same blocks. Like yeah. I never trained in that. I'm not a professional singer. I should right. be able to do that. Well, yeah, yeah, so you've heard it. Now I'm accountable for this because I've said it on. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's my plan. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, and I'm, I'm doing everything in just in my home studio. So I'm like layering five versions of trumpet all on top of each other and making trumpet choirs and That's singing so cool. multiple tracks. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah. Do you know who you should, so. um, have you ever heard of, I can't remember. I'm not going to think of his name right now. Speaking of the blank thing yeah, that happens, I get it. I right? Get it. But I interviewed this guy and he has a band called French Horn Rebellion. Have you ever heard of this? I haven't. You have to check it out. He okay. was on my podcast um, a couple of seasons ago and he does a lot of manipulation with electronically. And he'll be like, there's five tracks of horn at the beginning of this song and you listen and you almost don't even like he's manipulated it to the point where you can't really tell sometimes that it's oh, even a horn right yeah that sounds great <laughs> but then he and he sings he sings all the time and he plays his horn at concerts I, I have to check out what he's doing now because um he you know his big thing was touring and playing concerts and playing in clubs like and people would be like what and he's like playing the French horn on a stage That's like so a rock cool. band guy. And he has like the bat the bell is painted bright pink. And like all the slides are different colors. Whoa. It's like this unique trumpet that he, or horn that he had made that's a little bit more like a trumpet, he said. It's like the sound of it is much is not like your typical kind of mellow horn sound that okay. you have in an orchestra. He definitely modified it um, or had it made custom. 
but you should check it out because he's doing the, I mean, it's not the same as what you're doing, but he is using electronics and cool. like layering things and see, yeah. I mean, that's the cool, to me, that's part of the, part of what makes this also exciting though, is because electronics are like this, this like gateway or portal to wherever you want to go. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> laughing no. at myself. <laughs> so They're like a gateway. Don't you get that? No. I mean, what I mean is that, you know, you can do anything with them. You can kind of yeah. go anywhere from anywhere. And that's the, that's the really exciting, the reason why I gravitated to them so much and why I love teaching it is because if you want to do really ambient, lush soundscapes, or if you want to do like rhythmic music or whatever it is you want to do, with the same set of tools and the same basic skill set, you can do, you can go anywhere from, from anywhere. You just have to take the first step. There's That's another so one of cool. my, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it really can say, be an amazing was, thing. That was like a quotable moment when you were like, it's like the portal, but then you like cracked up at yourself. So it didn't make it so intense, but that's what was funny about it. So <laughs> no, I think that's really true. And you're right. Like if you take the example of the French horn player, just because um, that's my instrument, I've tended to go, oh, wait a second. Like I can't, I couldn't play rock music or I couldn't play bossa nova or whatever because I'm a horn player and that was written for that instrument uses music from you know 16 whatever to you know and so you feel like well it doesn't fit in other genres but like this what you're describing actually makes it seem like you could say oh well it does because i can just manipulate it or change some things and make it feel like it actually does fit in whatever i want whatever setting i want mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think i think it kind of you know, from my experience, what happens is you, you dip your toe in, you start making some music or some sound, and then your ear and your musical instinct will lead you to whatever direction you want to go. Because you'll be like, oh, I like that. Well, let's do more of that. Or, That's cool. oh, that was fun. And, and the amazing thing when you're working with an instrument like a, like a synthesizer or something like that, is it really is that immediate, mm -hmm. you know? You can kind yeah. of explore it and play it at the same time it's very different from when you're playing an acoustic instrument and you have all of this technique that you have to build up and practice before you're able to really be in the music making state. Right. Um, <clears throat> and if there's a new technique you wanna learn, you really have to go kind of shed that for a while before you can integrate it. So it's definitely not as immediate. Um, the pairing of those two things is really nice, you know, cause the acoustic side slows you down. It's like, okay practices for a few weeks right take your time but then the electronic side it's like all at your fingertips you can kind of design the sound listen to the sound and change it all within the span of a minute <laughs> that's so, so cool I yeah love it's so really much. fun it's fun awesome well I'm gonna put all of your tags Instagram tag and your website and the information to how to get on your next waiting list all in the show notes Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been fun.